Okay, we're now going to run a, a panel session um, and ask any questions you have for the speakers. So can I ask the speakers and the sponsors to come forward? Um, and Richard is going to run around with the mic. So um, now's your chance to ask some questions. Okay, so if anybody's got any questions, you want to put them there and Ri Richard will come with the mic. I think he's actually put every, everybody putting up their hands. Question over there. The question is for Gordy, uh, what level of protein for his dairy cows? So we changed that. In the world I used to live in, it was always 18% or better because I had a large amount of lucerne, a large amount of soluble nitrogen, a large amount of uh, alfalfa. As we balanced rations, still safe for fiber, but tighter and tighter with maize silage and, and all three components of the protein, the soluble, the, the digestible, and the bypass protein, we're comfortable right now in a 16.5 to 17% ration that leaks an MUN that we see somewhere between 8 to 12% uh, and not including, uh, yeah, so has a low MUN in our milk, milk urea and nitrogen and tells me I'm optimally balanced. Uh, I want to be careful about talking about percents of protein. Cows eat absolute grams, pounds, kilos, whatever. And uh, you can have a low percent protein in that dry cow ration, and as long as they eat a large volume because you've lowered the energy and they eat more, you get still the grams of protein you need into the cow. So same thing with our milk cow ration. As long as I get the intake in, the rate of passage stays slow, I have a healthy cow, a high percent forage, I'm comfortable at about 16 17% forage on Holstein diets I have. Okay, thank you. Greg's a real nutritionist here. You can either shake your head or yeah, yeah. yeah I totally agree. You know, I, that eight to ten MUN and sixteen to seventeen crude protein is is where I sit, and I think most nutritionists sit. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, question over here. Uh, can you say your name and question? Uh, Gary Mitchell from Stranraer in Scotland. Uh, I was one that just put my question to Greg. Um, he got up to speak about replacements, and when I looked at his arm, I wondered if that had been a replacement heifer. <laughs> <laughs> but he can maybe explain that later. Um, the, the main thing was, <laughs> uh, the main thing was you, you spoke about replacement heifers, but you didn't actually exp uh, speak much on about expanding a herd. And whether we make the decision of rearing more heifers or is about to buy a certain amount of heifers in, because I find from my own experiences it's very sore in cash flow to try and expand the heifer by grow, you know, by cows by growing the heifers. So what would be the analogy we'd use, because you were looking at the replacement cost, so it's like the trade-in value, but when you've got nothing to trade, how do you weigh up the decision what you do whether you buy in a rear? So if I understood the question right, the, the, the decision is whether you buy heifers or raise heifers. In an expansion. In an expansion. When you were using the trade-in, you were working with a cast cow value to try and work yeah. out whether you, you know, what it costs to rear your heifer. So what it's the same equation would you use if you're going to expand your herd. How do you work out, do we try and rear the heifers or do we buy the heifers in when we look at the cash flow of the business? What's the most financial sound way and the quickest way to expand your herd and get cash in your bank? So, you know, the, the, Dr. Fetro mentioned very well, and I, I couldn't agree more, that keeping the barn full every day of the year is fundamental. So an expansion, one of the, the downsides of an expansion, some people fill too slowly and have a lot of capital up front and they fill too slowly and uh, the dilution of that capital expense is, is difficult with not enough milk. So I think a strategy that fills the barn the quickest is one that generally works the best. So buying heifers uh, can certainly fill that. My question always is whether you're better buying milking herds or buying heifers when you're expanding a dairy or adding more. And all that's really easy, easy to model with that replacement cost formula. Um, whether you raise them, whether you buy them, whether you, whether you buy heifers or whether you buy milking herds, I think it, it all depends on what the market scenario is, what the costs are. It's very easy to model. That formula up there is kindergarten math. Put it in a spreadsheet, add it up, and see what works given your market scenario. But the key 
thing is get that barn as full as possible, as soon as possible, and keep it full. And I think you want to have a financial situation with your lender where you can make decisions to keep your barn full and not have your hands tied to where you can't get capital to get animals in. So uh, the, the capital allocation of a replacement program is rather difficult for a startup or a growing dairy because it's a two-year pipeline that you're investing in two years in heifers and yet you're still buying up front because you don't have heifers calving yet. So that becomes a little more of a lender issue of how you want to handle that capital. Uh, Mike Christie, Lambert Leonard and me. Um, question for Greg please. Uh, sex semen and, and, and the states, I'm just interested if that's had any impact on heifer price or heifer availability or do you see that having an impact on heifer replacement price? Well, I'm sure that sex semen has, uh, has impacted the number of heifers. Albert DeVries and others have modeled that. I tend to think good reproduction and good heifer programs have had a bigger impact because I'm, one of the numbers I track is, uh, is freshenings on a dairy and pregnancy hard count related to herd size. And herds that I see are freshening a much higher percentage of milking numbers than they ever have because we're getting lots of cows pregnant. They're calling a little bit heavier. So we're generating lots more babies than we have because guess what? We can get them pregnant. And these are even herds that aren't using sex semen. And so absolutely sex semen has an impact. How much, I really can't say because I don't know how much is used. I'm seeing a lot less than in the past. But I can assure you dairies in the U.S. that have not used any sex semen have bigger heifer herds than they've ever had solely because they're getting cows pregnant at a much higher rate than they ever had before. Okay, thanks. I'm just interested in knowing why they're getting more pregnancies. What's the secret? We're kind of uh, five years behind maybe. So what's the secret of getting cows pregnant? Well, I'm just a stupid nutritionist, right? So I wouldn't know such things. Um, I guess I would, what I would say is that uh, uh, the emphasis of management on systems to identify cows, restrain them, get semen in them, i.e. tail chalk and detect heat, I, I think it's all organization and hormone and protocols. In other words, I see uh, compliance of near 100% on dairies now. And you didn't see that five, ten years ago. So that extra increment of compliance of being able to find, identify cows, get shots into them, determine what's in heat and get semen in them, I think that's made a monumental difference. I really do. So, and then all the things we've done for cow comfort, blah, 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 all the stuff Gordy's talked about, that certainly helps too. But we're remarkably better than we used to be. Remarkably better. Well, at Fair Oaks and that, first of all, there's a huge apology, not apology, a huge congratulations to the dairy industry that's realized Holsteins can't breed. And so the sex semen, uh, not the sex semen, the semen sales industry, everybody else that's here, have now made a Holstein that breeds better. We've watched the nadar of their conception rate drop and it's going back up. Secondly, if you get cows to fresh and healthy, clean, we're putting semen in, every, in over 100,000 cows in the organization that have, my partners and I have together, and we're putting them in with a voluntary waiting period of 40 days in milk. What does 40 days in milk mean? It means that my success between 40 and 50 is identical to my conception success between 50 and 70 and 70 and 90. So that means I get 20% of my cows exposed to semen, and if they're exposed, they might get pregnant. If they never see semen, they don't get pregnant. 20% of my cows are exposed to semen before day 50. That means I turn her back around, back in a higher lactation. All of that works, and it works both on my jerseys and it works on my Holsteins. So the whole industry is starting to either comply with program breeding or get better at headlocks and tail chalk, or and a few of us have dropped voluntary waiting period because we have healthier, cleaner cows that we can get back in calf and it increases our babies and everything else. And so all of this has come together plus sex semen to make a wave of heifers that are done. I think the single biggest financial mistake I made on my dairy was to raise replacements. Given had I had the future crystal ball, they were an investment in my future, but I have not, I could buy I can, we just filled a dairy in Wisconsin, not my partners, that bought 4,000 of the breed average cow in the United States. They dropped 4,000 cows into the New Chester dairy just south of my dairy by 50 miles and they're at 90 pounds of milk. And they have the American herd. So 
John said it too to you guys, if you're not getting 85 pounds of milk without BST, something's wrong on your dairy and it's not choline, methionine, or lysine. Something's wrong with your, if you have a Holstein and you can't get 90 pounds, 42 liters of milk, something's wrong. I'm going, to, I'm going to make two comments. One, Gordy and I have to sit in the bar later on and talk about the economics of a short voluntary wait period, but I won't bore you all with that at the moment. Um, You've done it and I make more money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You've done it twice and I make more money. <laughs> Keep going. But the other thing I want to say, we all talked about cows breed better and we're producing more, more cows and, and having more heifers. I think it's very important to note that I think in the United States a significant part of the fact that we have more heifers is we don't kill calves. I think there's been very important changes in the American dairy industry in terms of how we feed milk-fed calves and how we keep heifers alive and get them breedable and grow them up. So our our loss of young stock between birth and first calving has gone down and that's a very important part of why we now have more heifers which is sort of a weird new and interesting problem for us. I have a question about that what you just were saying because it's very modern that uh, we are raising calves in another way we do push a lot of milk into the calves now so they are having a better first lactation is any of you, have you been calculating on that? Is it worse to put all that milk in to the beginning of the calf when we're reading, rearing and then get the, the milk in the first lactation? We never seen really calculation on that. Yeah, Mike Van Amberg uh, has done a lot of the research on that in Michigan State and it looks like if we do what we're consoling, c calling accelerated uh, feeding programs where we're really feeding a lot of milk to calves that it results in at least one and maybe two thousand pounds so it would be round numbers a thousand liters or more in each lactation in that animal when it calves later on and that is that is additional milk that cannot be gained by more rapid growth after weaning. In other words, you can't just feed them better later on and they'll catch up. There seems to be something happening in terms of what genes are turned on or something that we're, we're doing to those calves metabolically in that early stage of life when they're fed a very much higher plane of milk nutrition. So you do the math. If I'm going to give you in two years a thousand liters of milk at 30 pounds per, per hectoliter, so I'm going to give you $300 or pounds in the, in the first lactation, could you feed more milk to a calf two years earlier and make that work? Yeah, pretty easily, I think. Uh, and, and so now everybody wants to fine tune it and say, well, how much is really enough and do I have to do it really, really that much and all the rest? Uh, while they all figure that out, I would encourage people to the extent that they can and make a figure that we should be feeding a lot more milk to Holsteins. I mean, we developed a feeding philosophy of Holstein calves that since milk was so expensive, the job was to wean her barely alive, having fed her as little milk as possible, <laughs> and, and then hope she'll catch up. There was something I said earlier about not limiting energy intake to milking cows. That may be true of pre-weaning cows. Don't hear me wrong, that's not true of growing, hell, growing heifers. I mean, I'm not I interested in fat little butterball heifers, but yeah. I need to say something, otherwise I get bored here in this time. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a philosophy thought about that. And um, I'm doing my PhD in human medicine. It's part of their program. We, because in Wisconsin, we don't have a veterinary medicine PhD in epidemiology. And it's very well described. And there is some research that start to be doing in, uh, uh, in uh, heifers, how they uh, higher growths when they are small they impact the following lactation in humans it's very well described how low birth weights when they are born from mothers from with smoking uh, uh, history or anything they don't develop as good intellectually and physically when they are uh, high school or even higher education so there's a lot of research that is coming from heifers, uh, from calves uh, being fed a higher rate and developing uh, uh, not in a linear form, way more when they are fertile lactation heifers and more. So it's very well described a fact and uh, Alice Bach is doing something in Spain about that and, and in the States is obvious more risk being that. So. I would like uh, to hear John's comment on this. Uh, in UK we have seen in the recent, in fact, even currently, um, escalating feed costs 
against uh, milk prices that have kind of dragged, not keeping up with the feed costs. And some advisors have been telling farmers, oh, cut off the feed supplements, just feed maybe forages, and that will do for the time being. What would you advise in a situation like this? Formally, I would advise them to look at the two options, the lower feed inputs and the milk they're going to get out of lower feed inputs compared to, and then you get income over feed cost is what we call it, and compare the income over feed cost at the lower input level to the income over feed cost at the higher input level. And if, if you make more income over feed costs, then I'm all in favor of it. Uh, write me a letter if that really happens, I'll mail you a dollar. But, but usually, what happens is when you cut organic feed intakes that have been good and healthy for the cow, you lose more value in milk than you save in feed. Otherwise, why don't we just all feed straw and nothing else? It'd be really cheap. You know, cows probably wouldn't die and they might give us a little milk. I, it just, it, it, it is such a prevailing philosophy that times are hard, I have to cut my feed bill. And I'm perfectly okay with that as long as it doesn't cut your milk, milk check. And in most cases, it's going to cut your milk check. And milk's more valuable than feed. That's the bet dairy farmers make every day when they go feed their cows. They're betting that the feed they, they put out costs less than the milk they get back. And that's particularly true of extra marginal milk because they've already fed the cow, they've already built the building, they've already paid all those other expenses. Now it's just milk and feed. Okay, I'd just like to say thank you to the speakers. So if you'd just like to put your hands together, thank you.